Until the mid-1950s, the steam locomotive was a very common, but also incredibly thrilling sight to see in operation by people of all kinds, especially rail fans, seeing it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But starting in the mid-1940s, diesel locomotives started to emerge on American railroads, ending the American Steam Age forever. Although we have preserved quite a lot of classes of steam locomotives in the United States, especially enormous and very, very famous ones, not all classes of steam locomotives have survived beyond the days of steam. After all, preservation does not work like that. There are some classes of American steam locomotives that have no survivors today. And that is what this list is all about. Once thriving, east or west, north or south, here is my top 10 list of extinct American steam locomotives. Ranking at number 10 of this list are the Union Pacific's early challengers, or as many other people may call, Fetter challengers, after their designer, Arthur H. Fetter. And <laughs> yes, a few YouTubers have actually uh, covered this class before. And yes, I can hear you people start screaming that there are two challengers left. However, though, maybe just look at this picture. How about I explain their story? Before I explain the entire story, I will quickly point out the two differences between these two breeds of Union Pacific Challengers. The Fetter Challengers were built in 1939 and designed by Arthur H. Fetter before the Union Pacific Big Boys emerged, while the later Challengers, including 3977 and 3985, were constructed from 1942 to 1944 with 3977 and 3985 being built in 1943. In addition, the newer Challengers were designed by Otto Jobelmann, the same man who designed the Big Boys. And finally, the Fetter Challengers had no resemblance to the Big Boys, while the Jobelmann Challengers, or Heavy Challengers, did resemble the Big Boys, thus being called Big Boy's little brother. Now in the story. In the late 1930s, the Union Pacific Railroad needed larger and more powerful locomotives to haul increasingly heavy freight trains up the, the railroad's two toughest grades, Wyoming Sherman Hill in Laramie and the Wasatch Mountains in Utah, which are still two of the toughest grades to climb on the Union Pacific to this day. Although their 9000 class 412-2s, or Union Pacifics as they were actually called, were strong enough to haul such trains, However, they were just too rigid for those twisting mountains due to their incredibly long wheelbase of 12 driving wheels. Because of this, they were better suited to the flatlands, as the flatlands had nice gentle curves that can handle such a rigid wheelbase. Arthur H. Fetter, the Union Pacific's locomotive designer, or chief mechanical engineer at the time, designed a new breed of locomotives, which resulted in the form of his new 466 Fours. In 1939, the Union Pacific ordered 39 of these locomotives from Alco, or American Locomotive Company, and had them numbered 3900 through 3939. But just like all American railroads, the threat of World War II caused a massive wartime freight traffic increase, especially on the Union Pacific. And of course, as we all know, the Union Pacific's new locomotive designer, Otto Jobelmann, took the design of the Challengers and enlarged it and also changed the looks, resulting in the 4884 Big Boy. Then from 1942 to 1944, the Fetter Challengers were accompanied by Jobelmann's own Challengers which shared the same general look as the big boys. To avoid confusion between both breeds' road numbers, the Fetter Challengers were renumbered into the 3800 series. Essentially, from that point onward, they were now 3800 through 3839. Eventually, the Union Pacific began to dieselize in the early 1950s, and by the mid-1950s, all Fetter Challengers had been withdrawn from service. 
Although two heavy challengers survived beyond the days of steam, all 39 of the fetter challengers had been completely cut up by the early 1960s. Coming in at number 9 on my list, we have another Union Pacific design. This time, the MT Class 482s, or Mountains, of which 95 were built between 1922 and 1924, all of which by Alco, and also in three batches. The first batch, which came in 1922, consisted of the first 40 locomotives, numbered 7000 through 7039. Just like most Union Pacific locomotives, the UP482s were both used for regular passenger trains and freight trains as well. Some of them even bore the Union Pacific's iconic Greyhound livery. Additionally, this was also one of two classes of Union Pacific steam locomotives to ever be streamlined, the other being their 462 Pacifics which are now extinct. Like some Union Pacific steam locomotives, the lifespan of this class was mostly uneventful. When World War II came around, these locomotives additionally saw service pulling troop trains. Shortly after World War II, however, the Union Pacific started to dieselize, and by 1956, all 95 of these mountains had been withdrawn from service and scrapped that same year. It's quite a shame that these locomotives never made it beyond the days of steam, because we honestly don't have too many steam locomotives in the United States with 482 wheel arrangements. The only ones that I can think of up the top of my head that are still with us today are the Frisco 482s and the New York Central Mohawks. Yes, they call them Mohawks. But it would have been nice to have had a Union Pacific 482 preserved as well. Even on the entire continent of North America, there really aren't that many 482s left on this continent. This is the only proper melee on this list. Now what is that proper melee? Something that a lot of YouTubers have actually covered before. It is the Norfolk and Western's Y6Bs. I definitely know that you people are already going to start pointing out 2156. And since so many people have already explained the differences, I will try to keep it short here. Compared to the Y6As, the Y6Bs were a bit longer, had a slightly larger firebox, and a slightly higher tractive effort. With 166,000 pounds on the Y6As, and 170,000 pounds on the Y6Bs. So, technically, in other words, the Y6Bs are the most powerful steam locomotives in the world ever built in terms of tractive effort. And at 25 miles per hour, they could produce an equal power output to the Union Pacific big boys. And how many of them existed? The Norfolk and Western built a total of 30 of these locomotives in their own shops in 1948, numbered 2171 through 2200, making them some of the last steam locomotives built in the United States. Like the other Y-class variants before them, the Y6Bs were used for slow, heavy coal drags in the mountains of West Virginia and Virginia. And thanks to being compound melees, they had no problem doing it at all. But just like the Union Pacific big boys, the Y6Bs, despite their success, did not last forever. Like the Union Pacific, the Norfolk and Western began to dieselize in the mid-1950s, and by the early 1960s, all 30 of the Y6Bs had been withdrawn from service. Unlike the Union Pacific big boys, of which eight escaped the cutter's torch, none of the Y6Bs survived. There were attempts to save one locomotive, number 2174, which sat in a scrapyard until 1976. Unfortunately, however, the scrapyard owner had no interest in preserving steam locomotives, and as a result, the 2174 was tragically cut up. Fortunately, there are still two Y-class locomotives left in existence, those being number 2050, which is a Y3, and Y6A number 2156. So at least the legend of the Y-class is not gone forever. Standing in the seventh spot on my list, we have another Norfolk and Western design that may surprise you. 
that being the K-Class 482 Mountains. When it comes to production of these locomotives, it can be a bit all over the place, to say the least. The first batch had the first 16 locomotives, built from 1916 to 1917 in the Norfolk and Western shops and numbered 100 through 115, and classified as K1s. The K2s were divided into two subclasses, Class K2s and Class K2As. The Class K2 contained 10 locomotives, numbered 116 through 125, and built by Alco in 1919. The remaining, classified as K2As, were numbered 126 through 127, and built by Baldwin in 1923, making a total batch of 22 K2s. The last batch contained 10 locomotives, built in 1926 by the Norfolk and Western shops, and classified as K3s. Compared to the K3s, the K1s and 2s had 70-inch diameter driving wheels and saw service more often on passenger trains, and could also attain a higher speed. The K3s, on the other hand, had smaller driving wheels, measuring only 63 inches in diameter, making them slower but stronger than the previous two batches. In addition, the K3s were more frequently subjected to hauling freight trains. In addition, the K1s and 2s looked a bit different than the K3s. The K1s and 2s were eventually fitted with the very same streamlining carried by the Norfolk and Western's J-Class 484s. Because of this, they looked almost completely like a J-Class 484, except for having one less trailing axle. While the K1s and 2s spent their entire careers on the Norfolk and Western, the K3s did not see the same. During World War II, the first six of the K3s were sent to the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad, while the remaining four were sent to the Denver and Rio Grande Western. All ten K3s were then sold to the Erie Railroad in 1948, which then merged with the Nickel Plate two years later. Eventually, however, Dieselization on the nickel plate had commenced, and by 1954, all 10 of the K3s had been cut up. The K1s and K2s eventually suffered the same fate. By 1959, all of them had been cut up. I have similar reasons to preserving these locomotives like I have with the Union Pacific mountain types. Again, there aren't too many breeds of mountain types remaining in North America. Now, why would I want one of these locomotives preserved? Though fortunately, the legacy of the streamlining still lives on, through Class J484-611. And before you ask me, I have more interest in preserving a K2 than a K3 because the K3s never had any streamlining. At number 6 on my list, we have the Santa Fe 284s. Berkshires were used on several American railroads. The Nickel Plate, the Pear Marquette, Chesapeake and Ohio, the Erie, and the Louisville and Nashville, and more. But they were all Eastern American railroads. The Santa Fe Railroad was the only Western American railroad to ever use 284s. As for the Santa Fe, they had a total of 22 locomotives, though not all were originally Santa Fe locomotives. The first 15 locomotives, numbered 4101 through 4115, were built by Baldwin in 1927. But before we get to the remaining seven, let's talk about the first 15. The first 15 locomotives, designated as Class 4101s, were used for hauling freight trains across the Santa Fe system. But unlike the Berkshires on the Nickel Plate and Pear Marquette, which are practically similar to one another, the PM and nickel plate locomotives used 70-inch diameter driving wheels. Meanwhile, the Santa Fe Berkshires had 63-inch diameter driving wheels. In addition, the Santa Fe Berks also used Walshart's valve gears, while the PM and nickel plate Berkshires used Baker valve gear. And finally, the Pear Marquette and nickel plate Berkshires were also about 20 years younger than the Santa Fe Berks. Now, what about the other seven Berkshires? The remaining seven Berkshires were known as Class 4193s, but they were not built for the Santa Fe in the first place. They were originally seven of the Boston and Maine's T1 Berkshires. During the Second World War, the B&M sold these seven to the Santa Fe as the Santa Fe was experiencing a lack in motive power. 
Although the T1 suffered pretty badly from having issues with their trailing bogies, and also did not look very nice due to that coffin feed water heater, but most of them were rebuilt to look like Santa Fe locomotives. And I gotta say, that new Santa Fe look actually made them look quite awesome, if I gotta admit. <laughs> By the way, they also fixed the trailing bogey issue. Like the previous 15, the rebuilt locomotives were also used for hauling freight trains on the Santa Fe system, much like any other Berkshire. And just like the previous 15, there was no going back for these seven when dieselization commenced on the Santa Fe. Scrapping commenced on the Berkshires in 1949, and by 1955, all of them had been cut up. Being the only Western American 284s, it would have been nice if at least one of them was preserved. Not counting ones that survived in their B&M appearance, because it looks absolutely hideous. Anything else? I am perfectly happy with.